Hello and welcome back to part two of our video on the First Opium War. Now, just to catch you up briefly, uh, if you have not seen the first video, or if you have and would like to be reminded, follow the link if you are in the former camp in the description. But the British have just voted in favour of sending ships over to sort out the issues with the violation of free trade principles of the Qing government. And from here we continue off the story. Now, a lack of significant headquarters in China led the British to remove their commercial ships. However, the Royal Navy's China squadron remained in the Pearl River Estuary Islands. Palmerston ordered the East India Company to redirect troops from India in anticipation of a limited conflict with the Chinese while in London. But instead of a large-scale war, a punitive expedition was chosen. Superintendent Elliot oversaw Britain's China affairs in general, while Commodore James Bremer led the Royal Marines and the China Squadron. Major General Hugh Goff led British land forces, and later became British Forces in China Commander. Nice little promotion there for him. Well, the British government would fully fund the war, and according to Lord Palmerston's correspondence, the British had already planned a series of attacks on Chinese ports and waterways. The preparations for an expeditionary army began immediately after the vote in January 1840. In the British Isles, infantry regiments were established and shipbuilding was accelerated. Britain began using military forces from its overseas dominions for the upcoming conflict, and they had plenty of overseas dominions, don't you worry about that, the peak of the British Empire. Now, British India, of course, was one of those colonies, and they prepared for war after hearing of the opium being destroyed under the command of Lin Zexu. They recruited many Bengali volunteer battalions to support their British Indian Army and East India Company forces. The expedition ships were either in distant colonies or being repaired. But then, of course, there was the Oriental Crisis of 1840, which threatened war between Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire over Syria, which, of course, diverted the Royal Navy's European fleets from China, at least for a little while. British South Africa and Australia were ordered to send ships to Singapore, the expedition's meeting location, and several Royal Navy steamers were sent on the expedition as cargo ships. Atypical summer weather in India and the Strait of Malacca hampered the British deployment, and several incidents hampered their combat capability. The Royal Navy's two 74-gun ships of the line, which were to attack the Chinese defences, were temporarily disabled by damage to the hulls. Either way, British forces gathered in Singapore by mid-June 1840, despite these delays. While waiting for the ships, the Royal Marines practised amphibious invasions on the beach, after disembarking from boats, they formed lines to advance towards simulated defences. These days we call them war games. Well, the expedition's first group reached China in June of 1840 on 15 barracks ships, four powered, or well, steam powered gunboats, and 25 smaller boats. Commodore Bremer led the flotilla. Now, the British demanded financial compensation from the Qing government for 
trade disruptions and opium destruction. This is as we mentioned in part one after Lin Zexu confiscated it and basically destroyed the lot of it. Well, of course, over and over, the request was denied by the Qing government and the authorities in Canton. The Chinese would not give an inch, even though they knew they were severely outgunned. This was a war of principle for them. Well, Palmerston gave Elliot and his cousin, Admiral George Elliot, instructions to transfer at least one Chinese coastline island for commercial use. A combined naval and ground attack on Zhou Shan archipelago began after the British Expeditionary Force was positioned. The operation focused on Zhou Shan Island, the largest and most secure. The attack also sought to capture the island's strategic port of Dinghai. Elliot ordered Zhou Shan's surrender upon the British squadron's arrival, but the Chinese garrison commander refused the order, claiming he could not submit and questioning the British harassment of Dinghai given their expulsion from Canton. Hostilities began, and the Royal Navy destroyed a squadron of twelve small junks and British marines took control of the southern Dinghai hills. Yes, it did not go very well for the Chinese defence. A fierce naval attack on the 5th of July forced the Chinese to retreat, allowing the British to take full control of the city. British forces took Dinghai Harbour and prepared to use it as a military base in China. In autumn of 1840, a Dinghai garrison illness forced the British to move their soldiers to Manila and Calcutta. At the start of 1841, only 1,900 of the 3,300 troops who had occupied Dinghai were still there, and many of them could simply not fight, well, because they were all bent over, vomiting all over themselves, most likely. Well, most of the 500 British soldiers who died from illness were actually not technically British. Most of them were volunteers from Cameroon and also Bengal, while the Royal Marines, <laughs> they were, of course, unaffected. Funny how that works. Perhaps they were kept in more sanitary conditions. Well, after capturing Dinghai, the British expedition split up its troops, sending one fleet south to the Pearl River and another north to the Yellow Sea. The northern fleet reached the High River, where Elliot personally delivered Palmerston's message to the Emperor of the Qing. Now, the imperial court appointed Qi Shan, a prominent Manchu official, to succeed Lin as viceroy of Liangguang after Lin's dismissal of his opium-handling missteps. Qi Shan represented the Qing dynasty as chief negotiator while Elliot represented the British crown. Jijian and Elliot agreed to conduct future talks on the Pearl River after a week of negotiations. British representatives were politely asked, however, to leave the Yellow Sea. I don't know how politely, but, well, I'm sure the point was taken. Now, Jishan promised imperial funds to British merchants who lost money, and that's another deciding factor. But both factions continued to fight the war. In the late spring of 1841, more Indian troops arrived for a military campaign against Canton. Ships brought 600 skilled 37th Madras native infantry soldiers to Dinghai, boosting British morale. The newly built iron steamship HMS Nemesis, which is a badass name for a ship, accompanied the fleet to Macau. Chinese Navy had pretty much no effective defense against this powerful weapon. The cannons just would not even put a dent in it, 
and that's if the cannons could even reach it. Remember that the Chinese were using somewhat out-of-date weapons. A lot of them were weapons designed off or even purchased off the, Br off the Brits in uh, former times, which of course the British would never sell the most up-to-date stuff. That would be stupid. Well, on August 19th, three British cruisers and 380 marines expelled the Chinese from what was known as the Barrier, a land bridge separating Macau and the Chinese mainland. After the Qing soldiers' defeat and the arrival of the Nemesis at Macau's harbour, pro-British sentiment rose, leading to the expulsion and death of several Qing officials. But what about Portugal? This was Macau, after all. Well, they chose to kind of sit back and just enjoy the show, remaining neutral throughout the fight. After all, they had their own interests in Macau, and it was too early to tell how things were going to go. It seemed pretty obvious the British were going to win from the outset, but, well, you never know. Well, after the battle, Portugal did allow British troops to dock in Macau, which gave the British a fully operational port in southern China. The British focused on the Pearl River conflict after securing Dinghai and Macau, and the northern expedition moved south to Hu Men, known as the Bog, after the British victory at Chusan. Bremer believed that seizing control of the Pearl River and Guangzhou, or Canton, would give the British a strong bargaining position with the Qing government and help trade resume after the war. Because, of course, after all the fighting is done, there is still money to be made. And this is where we have step in Admiral Guan Tian Pei, who strengthened Qing positions in Hu Men during the British Northern Campaign. Now, Guan may have prepared for a position attack since Napier's 1835 incident. He feared that the British would forcefully advance up the Pearl River towards Canton, and the river was subsequently blocked by 3,000 soldiers and 306 cannons in the Humen forts. When the British fleet was ready to fight, 10,000 Qing soldiers were strategically placed to protect Canton and its neighbours. Early January saw the British fleet attack the Qing defences at Junpi. This followed the Chinese deliberately launching fire rafts at the Royal Navy ships, which was, well, that was the strategy, the best strategy at the time for taking out ships without too much collateral damage. Well, the Second Battle of Junpi, on January 7, 1841, the British were victorious. They defeated 11 Chinese Southern Fleet junks, and they even took the forts at Hu Men. The British victory allowed them to blockade the Bogue, forcing the Qing Navy to retreat inland. Qi Shan negotiated a peace deal with Britain to avoid further escalation because the Pearl River Delta was so important to China and the British Navy's dominance made it difficult to recapture. Thus, the Convention of Junpi, written by Qi Shan and Elliot on January 21st, sought to effectively end the war. The Convention exchanges Hong Kong Island for Zhou Shan, frees British shipwrecked or kidnapped prisoners, and reopens trade in Canton by the 1st of February 1841, to establish equitable diplomatic privileges between Britain and China. China was also meant to pay six million silver dollars for the 1838 opium destruction in Humen. However, the legality of the opium trade was intentionally left for later consideration. Although Qi Shan and Elliot negotiated successfully, their governments refused to ratify the pact. 
the Daoguang Emperor was furious that a treaty was ratified without his consent, especially one that would relinquish Qing land. And I don't blame him for being angry. Qi Shan definitely crossed the line with that one. So he ordered the arrest of Qi Shan, who was sentenced to death, but was later commuted to military service. Lucky for him. Well, Lord Palmerston called Elliot back and refused to endorse the convention, wanting more concessions from the Chinese as per his first instructions. Yes, you see, Lord Palmerston's problem with it was that it wasn't enough in the favour of the British. Well, I think Elliot at this point probably just wanted to take a bit of a rest from all the fighting. Well, the temporary ceasefire ended in February, when the Chinese refused the British trade access to Canton. HMS Nemesis's longboat was fired at by artillery from a fort on North Wangtong Island on February the 19th, which prompted a British response. The British commanders ordered a new Pearl River blockade and military operations against the Chinese. The British captured the remaining Bog forts in the Battle of the Bog and the Battle of First Bar on February 26th and 27th. It was this victory that allowed their navy to advance upriver into Canton. And on the 26th of February, poor old Admiral Tian Pei died in battle. Rest in peace to Guan Tian Pei. Well, the British took Huangpu on March the 2nd after deconstructing a Qing fort near Pajo. This military operation directly threatened eastern Canton. Major General Gough, who had arrived from Madras on HMS Cruiser, personally led the assault on Huangpu. Superintendent Elliot, who was unaware at this time of his dismissal, and the Governor-General of Canton declared a three-day ceasefire on the 3rd of March. British forces left Zhou Shan for the Chunpi Convention and reached the Pearl River from the 3rd to the 6th. The Chinese military received more troops, and General Yang Fang led 30,000 soldiers near Canton on March the 16th. Now, as the main British fleet prepared to travel up the Pearl River to Canton, three warships headed to the Xi River estuary to navigate the river between Macau and Canton, HMS Samarang, Nemesis, and Atalanta, were Captain James Scott's and Superintendent Elliot's fleets. Even though the waterway was only six feet deep in some places, the British steamships could navigate in shallow waters and approach Canton from a route the Qing considered, at least at this point, to be unfeasible. Between the 13th and 15th of March, British forces captured or destroyed Chinese naval vessels along the river, and they also managed to get quite a lot of artillery and military equipment. After defeating Chinese defences along the Pearl River, the British considered marching to Canton. Superintendent Elliot advised the British to first negotiate with the Qing authorities from their advantageous position, rather than fight it out in Canton after the truce expired on the 6th of March. But the Qing, instead of attacking the British, decided to fortify their city turtle strategy. Chinese military engineers also began building fire rafts, gunboats, and mud earthworks along the riverside, sinking junks to form river blocks. Chinese merchants were ordered to seize all silk and tea from Canton to hinder trade, and the local population was forbidden from feeding the British river ships. 
A Chinese fort shot at a British vessel flying a truce flag on March 16th, and in response the British set the fort on fire with rockets. These actions convinced Elliot the Chinese were indeed preparing for a long battle. On the 18th of March, the British attacked Canton after the Broadway expedition ships returned to the fleet. They took the 13 factories, with very few casualties, and raised the Union Jack over the British factory. After negotiating with Koong merchants, the British partially captured the city and resumed trade. British forces captured Canton's elevated terrain after several military victories, and another ceasefire was finally declared on the 20th of March. Elliot ordered most Royal Navy cruisers downstream to the Boca Tigris, and that was despite the commander's objections. Now, moving on to mid-April, Yi Shan, the Viceroy of Liangguang and the cousin of the Daoguang Emperor, arrived in Canton. He ordered envoys to Elliot, kept trade open, and began gathering military resources outside of Canton. The Qing army quickly gathered 50,000 soldiers from outside the city, while trade revenue was used to repair and strengthen the defences of Canton. Many small river vessels were armed. Chinese soldiers were stationed in Huangpu and the Boca Tigris, and artillery batteries were hidden along the Pearl River. Specifically, the Daoguang Emperor ordered the Qing army to eradicate the rebels at all locations and expel British forces from the Pearl River, Hong Kong, and indeed China in general. The foreign merchants in Canton, already skeptical of Chinese intentions, after learning about the Qing military expansion, widely distributed this directive. Some Koong merchants and their families managed to leave the city in May, raising concerns about a resurgence of violence. There were rumours that Chinese divers were training to cut openings in British ship hulls, and that fire raft fleets were being prepared to fight the Royal Navy. Due to the unit conflicts and distrust of Yi Shan, the Qing army weakened during their preparations. You see, Yi Shan was not from around here, and he publicly disdained Cantonese people and soldiers, preferring troops from other provinces. Yi Shan issued a statement on the 20th of May, urging Canton residents and foreign businessmen to simply be calm and just ignore the assembling military forces, as there was no likelihood of conflict. As you can imagine, pretty much nobody believed that. Well, the next day, Elliot formally requested that all British merchants leave the city before sunset, Additionally, several warships were ordered back to their positions in front of Canton. And on the evening of the 21st of May, the Qing struck. They launched a coordinated nocturnal attack on the British military and naval fleet. Qing soldiers recaptured the British factory after concealed artillery batteries in Canton and along the Pearl River were fired which the British thought were out of operation. They soon found out that they were well and truly in operation. Oh, and at Canton there were also 200 fire rafts linked by a chain that were sent to attack the Royal Navy, while fishing boats with matchlock cannons engaged them. The British warships managed to evade attack, while wayward rafts lit Canton's waterfront, illuminating the river and countering the night attack. Slightly downstream at Huangpu, the Chinese attacked British ships anchored there and tried to block the Canton-bound ships. Major General Goff, 
delayed his offensive and consolidated British forces in Hong Kong out of fear of an invasion. He quickly ordered a march up river to Canton, and on the 25th of May, some four days later, the additional troops arrived, and the British retaliated by capturing the remaining four Qing forts above Canton, and commenced to bombard the city. After capturing the city heights, the Qing troops fled in fear, forcing the British to pursue them into the countryside. Around 20,000 peasants and townspeople attacked 60 Indian sepoys gathering supplies on May 29th. Well, the San Yuan Li incident defeated said sepoys. You know, it's just so funny to hear about all this because so many of these names, they're still, well, they're still places and areas within modern Guangzhou, like San Yuan Li and Huangbu and Pan Yu, all these places. Well, Goff ordered a river retreat after the San Yuan Li incident. And then the British began to occupy Canton officially on the 30th of May, 1841. Well, that, for at least now, ended the war. The British and Canton's Governor-General agreed to cease fire after the British captured the province. Of course, this is the war in Canton, but there's plenty of other battles to fight before the day is out. Well, under the Limited Peace Agreement, also known as the Ransom of Canton, the British were paid to leave the forts. This withdrawal was completed quite quickly. In fact, the following day, on the 31st of May. But Elliot unilaterally ratified the peace accord without British army or navy input, once again stepping out of line and this angered General Goff. Yishan declared Canton's defence a diplomatic victory, which, well, it's not as good as a normal victory, but you've got to swing it somehow, don't you? He wrote to the Emperor that the barbarians had begged the esteemed military leader to plead with the Emperor to forgive their debts and allow them to trade again. In exchange, they promised to quickly remove their ships from the Boca Tigris, and never disrupt it again. However, General Yang Fang was chastised by the Emperor for accepting a truce rather than fighting the British. The Emperor was, however, unaware that the British mission had survived and was well and truly operational. Thus the Imperial Court debated China's war strategy because the Daoguang Emperor wanted Hong Kong back. Now, after leaving Canton, the British Expeditionary Force went on to Hong Kong. British commanders discussed a war strategy like Chinese commanders. Elliot wanted to end military operations and resume trade, while Major General Goff wanted to seize Amoy and block the Yangtze that being the Yangtze River, a little further north. Well, a July typhoon, which, well, there's a typhoon every July in Hong Kong, damaged the British ships that were in Hong Kong Harbour, and destroyed some expedition buildings on the island. On July the 29th, Elliot learned Henry Pottinger had replaced him as superintendent. On the 10th of August, Pottinger began his administrative duties in Hong Kong, and he wanted to negotiate with the Qing dynasty for all of China, not just the Pearl River region. He refused Canton Chinese envoys and ordered the expeditionary force to proceed with its military plans. Admiral Sir William Parker arrived in Hong Kong to lead the British naval forces in China after Humphrey Fleming's Senhouse died of a fever on the 29th of June. 
British commanders agreed to move combat operations north to pressure Peking. That's the old name for Beijing, by the way. Thus, on August the 21st, the fleet headed to Amoy. Now, British ships entered the Zhoulong River estuary and reached Amoy on the 25th of August. But the city was well aware that they were on their way. They had prepared for a naval attack by building a lot of gun positions in the gigantic granite cliffs that were overlooking the river by Qing military engineers. Parker thought a naval attack alone was too risky. So, Goff led a naval ground offensive against the fortifications. The Royal Navy's covering fire helped the British Marines and regular troops defeat the Chinese river defences on August 26th. And despite over 12,000 cannonballs from the British Navy, the Chinese cannon positions actually survived. British soldiers, however, did successfully ascend and take the position. When Amoy was empty on August the 27th, British troops went to the inner town and detonated the castle's powder magazine. They captured 26 Chinese junks and 128 cannons, and they threw them into the river. Lord Palmerston wanted Amoy to be a global trading hub after the war, but Goff issued strict orders to prevent looting and authorised officers to execute any pillagers found. However, many Chinese merchants feared being labelled as disloyal to the Qing, and they declined British protection. Now, the British troops did set up a small military outpost on a river island and blocked the Jolong River. But without military protection, peasants, criminals and deserters pillaged the town. Well, order did return within days after the Qing recaptured the city. Following their victory, the city governor claimed that five British ships had been sunk. Now, back in Britain, parliamentary changes ousted Lord Palmerston as foreign minister on the 30th of August. Succeeding him was William Lamb, the second Viscount Melbourne, who took a more calculated approach to China. Lamb stayed with the war. September 1841 a short gunnery battle with the Chinese fort destroyed the British transport ship Nerbuda on a rock off Taiwan's northern coast. In March of 1842, the brig Anne sank on another reef. The survivors of both ships were arrested and taken to southern Taiwan for imprisonment, which is as fun as it sounds. But the Qing authority were not so kind to the other 197 people they had, who they executed on August the 10th, 1842. And additionally, 87 of those prisoners died from mistreatment. This was called the Nerbuda Incident. Well, in October of 1841, the British consolidated their control over the central Chinese coast, Zhou Shan was ceded to Hong Kong by Qi Shan in January of 1841, and after this the Qing re-established military presence on the island. British troops invaded the island to prevent the Chinese from strengthening its defences, and the British attacked the Qing on October 1st. They defeated 1,500 Qing soldiers in Chu Shan, it was called the Second Capture of Chushan, by the way. And they took the city without too much of a hard time of it. Either way, the victory restored British control over Dinghai's vital port. On October the 10th, nine days later, a British naval fleet attacked and took control of a fortress near Ningbo, 
central China. It's sort of near Shanghai. It's a very nice city just to the south of it called Cixi. I went there once. It's quite a quaint little town. It's got a beautiful little park next to it. It's a lovely little lake. Oh, it's so lovely. There's nothing more charming than a second or third tier Chinese city. Oh, they're just lovely places to be. So peaceful. So nice. Well, this battle in Ningbo decisively defeated the Chinese. The 1,500 strong Chinese forces evacuated Ningbo after losing, and the British took control of it on October the 13th. British troops took over a city-based imperial cannon factory. Qing armaments replenishment was greatly hampered by this event. The city's conquest also threatened the Qiantang River, and the British leadership reassessed their strategy for Chinese occupation and war spoils, now that they had Ningbo under their wing too. More bargaining power means they can tack on a few more war goals to that agreement. Either way, things were not looking good for China at this point. Admiral Parker and Superintendent Pottinger wanted the British to take part of all Chinese assets as war spoils, and they mean all of them. The whole thing. I mean, they may as well just try to annex them at this point. However, General Gough believed such a policy would incite Chinese resentment, as if the Chinese didn't already resent them enough. He believed that public property should be seized instead. British merchants were, after all, wronged, so the British doctrine required 10% of all property confiscated by British expeditionary forces to be taken as war spoils. Gough stated that this decree would force his troops to penalise one group of thieves for the advantage of another. British military operations were halted in the winter of 1141 to replenish supplies. The Emperor in Beijing underestimated the British threat due to Yishan's misinformation. The Daoguang Emperor discovered too late in 1841 that his Canton and Amoy officials were actually exaggerating reports. I don't know why they do things like this. The individual ordered Guangxi governor Liang Chang Cho to report Canton events accurately, or else. Yishan was summoned to the capital and tried by the imperial court. Eventually he was removed from power. Thus, when the Chinese villagers and cities realized the true British threat, they fortified themselves against naval invasions, because someone's got to do it. In spring of 1842, the Daoguang Emperor ordered his cousin Yi Jing to recapture Ningbo. Rifles and naval guns helped the British garrison defeat the attack on Ningbo on March 10th, and the British lured the Qing army into the streets before attacking killing many of them. On the 15th of March, the British also captured Cixi after chasing the retreating Chinese army. Remember that charming little town I told you about? Oh, yes. Now, the Battle of Chapu on the 18th of May took the strategic port of the same name. Now, the British Navy bombardment forced the town to surrender. Goff lauded the eight, 300 rather, eight banners, soldiers, who halted the British army for hours for their bravery. Now, on the June 14th, the British fleet took the Huangpu River mouth. The Battle of Wu Song on June the 16th gave the British control of Wu Song and Bao Shan. British troops occupied Shanghai's unguarded outskirts on the 19th of June, and the retreating Qing bannermen 
British soldiers and locals looted Shanghai after the battle. <clears throat> Qing Admiral Chen Hua Cheng also died while guarding a Wuzong fortress. A brave way to go. Now the capture of Shanghai made Nanjing vulnerable to attack. And Nanjing is very important because it literally name not the name literally means southern capital. Nan meaning southern, Jing meaning capital, as is Beijing means northern capital. Another thing, um, Tokyo in Chinese is Dongjing, so uh, that means eastern capital. There is no Xijing. I don't know. Maybe Xijing is kind of Xi'an. Go and look up Xi'an, it's where the terracotta warriors are. So, the capture of Shanghai made Nanjing vulnerable to attack. And that was a big problem. But the Qing Emperor protected Liangjiang province with 56,000 Manchu bannermen and Han Green Standard soldiers. They also strengthened their Yangtze River defences. And to defend Beijing from an expected attack, the British Navy in northern China relocated resources and personnel. The Qing commander in Liangjiang province freed 16 British prisoners to achieve a ceasefire and buy a little time. Both the Qing and the British, however, rejected reconciliation. The Daoguang Emperor did secretly consider a peace accord with the British, but only for the Yangtze River. If the agreement was completed, if the British forces would have actually been paid to stay out of the Yangtze. Now, on July the 14th, the British Navy sailed up the Yangtze. Gough prepared to seize Zhenjiang after a reconnaissance revealed its strategic importance. Most of the city's firearms were actually moved to Wuzong and seized by the British after their takeover. And according to Chinese sources, more than 100 traitors were executed in Zhenjiang before the war due to poor organization by Qing commanders. The British fleet reached the city on July 21st and destroyed the Chinese force protecting it. An untimely British landing occurred after Chinese defenders withdrew to nearby hills. And thus, the Battle of Zhenjiang began in earnest when many Chinese warriors left the city, or at least tried to, causing a violent conflict. British engineers broke through the western entrance and entered the city, sparking street fighting. And the war devastated Zhenjiang, forcing many Chinese soldiers and their families to take their own lives rather than surrender. As for the British, well, they only lost 36 men while capturing the city. This doesn't sound like too much, but it was actually the highest loss for all of their battles in China in that war. Hmm, 36. Well, after capturing the city, the British fleet strategically severed the Grand Canal, which completely immobilized the Taoyuan system and hindered Chinese grain transport across the empire. The British left Zhenjiang on the 3rd of August to sail to Nanjing, and on the 9th of August they reached Jiangning district and were ready to attack by August 11th. Despite not having the emperor's approval, Qing city officials agreed to the British negotiations. Qi Ying, a Manchu high court officer, and Li Pu led a Chinese delegation from Nanjing to join the British Navy on the 14th of August. As the British delegation insisted, the Daoguang emperor accept the treaty. Negotiations lasted for weeks. 
But on August the 21st, the Daoguang Emperor did allow his ambassadors to sign the peace treaty with the British after the court recommended it. And this treaty of Nanjing ended the First Opium War on August 29th, 1842. The British and Qing officials signed the document on HMS Gorn Wallace. And just like that, the conflict concluded with the ratification of that inaugural unequal treaty, that dirty word treaty of Nanjing. The Qing Empire acknowledged Britain as a peer to China, and were forced to grant British citizens extraterritorial rights in treaty ports in the supplemental Treaty of the Boge. Hong Kong was also ceded to Britain, and in 1844 the United States and France both signed their own treaties with China. Furthermore, alongside the opening of China to European opium traffickers, there was a significant increase in the European trade of Chinese coolie labor. English-speaking entrepreneurs commonly refer to this trade as poison and pigs. Ever wondered who built the railroads in the United States? Hmm. Coolie. Hard work. Well, thank you very much for finishing part two of the First Opium War. And I know what you're thinking. If the First Opium War was so good, why wasn't there a sequel? Well, it's coming out. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll do it. I'll be doing it right after this one. In fact, I might even start on it right now. Well, in a different video, I'll start recording it. You will have to wait until I upload it. But anyway, I think that's enough for one night. Now, I'd like to thank my top tier patrons. Dark, Curry, Kimberly, Ember, Ben, Britt, Charles, Aaron, James, Jeffrey, Melissa, Scott, Stark Factory, and Wendy. Thank you very much. Hope you all enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next exciting video. Good night, everyone. Lots of love to you all.